So, what questions have we got? Here we go. Question number one. What qualifications should, should industrial horticulture farmers have and how will you enforce new laws around industrial horticulture environmental runoff from their properties? Who wants to answer that one? Susan? Have a go. Have a go. Yeah, okay. I mean, we came as tree changers and uh, we did a num uh, couple of TAFE courses. So, we've got Cert, cert 4 in hort horticultural production. Um, they're pretty good. Um, it was designed specifically for mag uh, macadamias. And uh, definitely, um, TAFE has had their chem chemical uh, certificate reduced. I think it should be go back to the length it was. So, there are a couple of courses that'll get you going as a farmer. Um, working with land care is a bit of a band-aid uh, solution uh, for weeds and stuff when you first c come on a farm it can be really daunting. So that's quite an um, economical way to educate farmers as well. So they'd be the sort of least qualifications I think our farmers should have if you haven't grown up doing it your whole life. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, yeah, I'd like to echo. I'd like to echo what Susan said and say we really need to have a really strong TAFE. Um, one of the Greens' policies to is to 100% fund TAFE as the only vocational education provider. Um, we've got some really good ideas too about creating job pathways through doing horticulture and rural studies, certificate one and two, and working on reveg and fencing off rivers. I think um, protecting our waterways is one of the really important things, steps that we can do to stop chemical runoff and also to, uh, to raise the water table. Regenerative farming, we need to be planting on waterways, fencing them off, training young people, providing jobs. I think at the moment you need more qualifications to cut people's hair than you do to grow food that people eat. And I don't agree with that. I think there actually should be a, an actual license to farm, um, you know, some sort of qualification. But with that, there is a flip side that you will make the barrier to entry for farmers' markets and for smaller farmers harder. So we need to balance that somehow. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an issue. Um, that basically anyone can go in and grow food and sell it to anybody at any time. Um, the supermarkets, the large supermarkets have a course that you have to run uh, before you can supply them. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's enough. Um, I, I guess I would just like to ask, you know, who are the experts? Who are the mentors? Who are the leaders? A few people have mentioned regenerative agriculture and I've just been reading a bit about that subject and it makes me think that we actually know very little about the way the water moves through the Australian landscape. That book and that, that body of work is kind of the beginning of actually a whole different way of, of thinking about the Australian landscape. Um, yeah, so I think we actually have a lot to know. There's not many people out there that already hold the knowledge that we can actually learn it from because those people are gone. Uh, yeah, look, what I'd like to quickly say is uh, I think there's an opportunity for further education for farmers. I mean, I know for myself, I really benefited a lot from getting an understanding of looking at how organic farming works and looking at understanding how the soil biology works, that the soils are alive. And I think a lot of farming in today's era basically just sees soil as a substrate you put a plant in and then you put in NPK and blah, 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 blah. Here we are at the supermarket. So I would like to see a little bit more of a, uh, a biological farming process go on. And, but on top of that, I think that education is great. But what I'd also like to do, because I think the question also was looking at um, intensive horticulture, I think there almost needs to be a, a conservation land management course offered to some of these farmers because I, I'm at the point where the, 
the value system or the disregard for our environment is so kind of obvious that there's a there's a breakdown in the relationship between how we are farming and the food we are for farming and the sustain sustainability of just the forest ecosystem biodiversity and the water. So maybe there's an opportunity there just to kind of offer a low grade, maybe a Cert 3, maybe a Cert 4 if they're serious, but a, a, a conservation land management type course could well be a, a benefit. Look, I'd just like to echo what my friend on the right said in relation to TAFE. When, when I went to TAFE, it was free. Now it costs money. Uh, I've run TAFE programs in the jails and in the juvenile justice system. We've, all, we've had all that shut down. We used to run certificate one and two in horticulture and automotive, and that's all, that's all been taken away. It's now a user pays system, and it's based on outcomes. So it's very, very difficult for um, people of lower income or socio situation to access those courses. I would have to say that I think that it's probably got to be attacked from both ends. So you can um, undertake education um, for people who are going into the farming industry, but at the same time we also need to con educate our consumers. And quite a view, the two speakers that we had here earlier this evening are obviously well advanced down that path and hearing people like them share their passion for what they do and their belief in how they eat and how they live is um, critical to what goes on. I think that young people are actually very open to all of this. I've got a not so young daughter who um, lives in Sydney and I've watched her go from insisting on having fish fingers as a child to now uh, teaching me things that I don't know about food. So they're open to it. Um, congratulations to the two of you. Keep up the good work and certainly TAFE is um, always been a huge benefit to our society and public education generally and we need certainly to um, put our resources behind that. I just didn't want to miss my turn. Um, look, I, I don't, I, I'll, I'll say something you shouldn't say in, in political life, I don't know. I don't know what qualifications farmers should have. I do know that people who, who operate a farm should be accountable though and accountability means compliance. And Regulation without some sort of a compliance regime is worse than useless. It's actually detrimental because it rewards the cowboy and it penalises the person who does it properly. And, and the fact that we've had a, this laissez-faire approach from conservative governments over the last eight years is of detriment to our community and it's of detriment to our environment. Okay, should we move on to another question? Okay, Australia is still using a number of chemicals that have been banned in the USA and Europe due to major health issues. What will you do to bring Australia up to speed with the rest of the world? Yeah, if you can just share that mic, that'd be great. Is there a reference to a particular chemical? No, no, yeah, you don't all have to answer, just, yeah, you're not, you're all, not all obliged to answer that, just, no, there's no reference to a specific chemical, who asked the question, did you have a specific chemical in mind, or just generally, I know there's quite a few chemicals that are banned in Europe and the USA that are still used in Australia. Not Roundup. Do you want me to read them out of one No, no, just chemicals in general. Yeah. The, the comment is basically that they're regulated by a federal authority, the APVMA, and in Australia the best information that we have we should rely on that science. Um, I know there's issues with the APVMA now that they've moved to Armidale, um, the staffing issues or whatever they have there, but ultimately they're the authority in Australia. Yeah. So it's a federal... It's a federal issue rather than a state one. Yes, and the decision to move it to Armidale was extremely unhelpful, I think, for the organisation and its efficiency. 
Uh, I'll briefly say that there was some research re uh, done uh, recently looking at pesticides in, uh, in, in people's urine and they've found up to 14 different types of pesticides in people's urine. So when they actually put those people on an organic diet, they found after a week those pesticides declined. So I don't know if that's linked, but all chemicals that we put on our food are possibly entering into our body, something to think about. Yeah, look, and I, I'm, I'm representing the shooters and fishers, and I'll echo what Gurmesh said, that we've got a federal regulator that controls what happens and what's safe to use they, in Australia, and we stand by that. I'd have to say that I would be looking um, to the international um, arena for an answer to this one. We've got 28 countries who in recent times have banned the use of a variety of pesticides. Um, there's something like 4,000 pieces of litigation going on in the states at the moment um, from people who feel that they've been impacted by uh, pesticides. There's studies going on into the gut health of insects and human beings as a result of what um, happens to our microbes in our body on this area. There's a lot of research to be done. People need to listen. Our government needs to open eyes. I don't believe it's only a federal issue. It has to work from the ground upwards. It's local, it's state, and it's federal. Well, uh, during the years that I farmed, um, when I used to hang out with the processors and other macadamia farmers, um, they always used to say, oh, this chemical's uh, been banned in the US and banned in France, but we still got another 10 years here. And um, they consistently said that. And um, I, I kind of believe some people in my industry are absolutely captured by those chemical companies. I think the APVMA has too many board members that may have had jobs at Inzitep, Pivot or whatever you want. So um, I don't have much faith or trust in it. Um, when I, I came off my uh, chemical addiction, I suppose, on the farm over a few years, in the end, our sprayer got uh, cancer, so we stopped spraying. And uh, within about two years after that, uh, there's very little difference as to whether I sprayed or not. When you spray, you wipe out every single pest. When you don't spray, you grow good bugs that eat the bad bugs, and you get about the same amount of loss. So, um, it, and at the same time, the farm's a much nicer to pl place to be. Um, so the other thing is that um, from a Labor, New South Wales Labor point of view, um, through our uh, rules minister, you know, it is possible to uh, get grants, I believe, if Labor will take government. And we can begin to test more thoroughly for pesticide residue in food. Like I've become uh, too afraid to eat an apple when you hear it's got 26 applications of spray. So, you know, I'd like a bit more certainty about what I'm eating. I don't... At Nambucca, we don't have a farmer's market. The closest one is Bellingen once a fortnight. You know, I'm stuck shopping at Woolworths or IGA, so um, other than what my friends can grow in the neighbourhood. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'd like to see us have more science and understanding in this field. So it, it's, it's a big issue. I'd just like to say, well said, Sue. Believe in science. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Next question. As a state member, would you support and endorse the continuation of the farmland mapping projects that have been and will be undertaken? For example, the Mid North Coast Farmland Mapping Project. Um, and it's like, and the ability of local government to introduce their own important farmland mapping overlays to define and protect rural lands, and in particular, the promotion of RU4 primary production small lots. Did you get that one? That's I, quite a long one. I don't, I don't have any knowledge of that, but uh, if, I was, if I am elected to represent the people of Oxley, I'll bloody find out. <laughs> uh, as uh, local farmers down in Valor, um, we used to, the idea of what can be a farm gets told to you through dictionary def definitions. So a quarry can be a farm or a truck depot can be a farm and uh, we objected to a truck depot down in our place enormously. Um, and uh, 
it was ma farmland mapped to be a farm of state significance and we thought they'd listen to that on council but uh, no they didn't. So um, I do know the councillor who did quite a lot of work on this farmland mapping so you seem to get distortions in things like this. You, it, it's very hard because you're going on past use so things change on a landscape so I'm not, not quite sure how valid the farmland mapping is when it comes to planning because you get different outcomes. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to have an RU4 small lot farming, uh, but then again you need to put a planning process over it. What, what are the buffers, what does it mean for your neighbours, you know, what can you do on it, um, how can we all live as a community out here on our land. So um, there's always uh, different unintended consequences with these things. They often sound pretty good, but by the time they get through the local government mill they don't always quite work out sometimes. Um, this is probably an area that I'm not really all over. Um, the, the, the words that I'm hearing are small lot farming and to me that's a big part of the way, of the future and the way forward that um, we need to actually bring home our um, food sources. We need to, um, and let's face it, I'm not doing it but I believe in it, um, we need to actually be growing a good portion of our own food and there are ways that that can be done in a domestic situation now with vertical farming and, and that type of thing. Um, I think there's a great place for small holding, um, agricultural um, and horticultural um, cropping um, for immediate consumption. Um, I'm sure it's going to be um, much healthier for us for that. The other side of that is that we are not then shipping our food from one end of the country to the other, from one end of the planet to the other. We're not throwing fossil fuels into the air, etc. We're not using um, packaging, shipping, etc. So as far as I'm concerned, um, small holdings are um, really the, um, one of the major ways forward for us as a species. Last night we had questions on RU1 and RU2 lands which we all responded to and that was in relation to DAs and things like that. I'm not familiar with an RU5, RU4, RU4. What size is an RU4? One, one or two hectares, okay, so that's the size of my property. So if I wanted to farm something on my property on two hectares, or I've got three, I'd expect that I'd be able to do that. And I would, I, and that's coming under the, our right to farm legislation. What would concern me is if the council whacked an e-zone across the middle of it and I had to pay rates on it that I couldn't do dump something with. And that's what we won't, we won't want. Uh, okay, so in terms of mapping, I'm certainly in support of mapping and having an, an understanding of what the layers of vegetation are in the uh, community and particularly relationships to corridors, waterways, roadways, the whole thing. So looking at how mapping can benefit uh, planning is, uh, I think it has advantages. In terms of the RU4, um, I'm actually concerned that the, the approach that the DPI are using uh, now after trials that uh, they've done up in the northern councils of Lismore, Kyogle, Byron, Ballina and the Tweed, um, what they're actually doing is scrapping the RU4s and replacing it with just a, a, a generic residential zoning because they don't believe that the RU4 has um, enough environmental conservation values in it to maintain it as a, a significant environmental um, area. So, um, and that I guess is falling into things like rural residential. I'm certainly in support of um, small acreages and people being able to make farms work. I mean, that example I was talking about in Canada, um, the one guy, Fortier, he actually m makes 100,000 Canadian dollars a year on one and a half acres of land intensively growing organic food. So, you know, we can do that if we're smart and it would be great to see, say, farmers, you know, being uh, introduced to those concepts. So I'm certainly in support of RU4. Um, I think that farmland mapping or maybe soil mapping is useful to have information about, but it's kind of implying that farming and residential are somehow mutually exclusive and I think what we need to be aiming for is a system where living next door to a farm 
isn't a danger to you, isn't an inconvenience to you, and having a resident next door to a farm is also not a danger or an inconvenience. Um, in the in the in the 1980s, the council um, did a quite a significant mapping of banana lands, and part of that was in response to banana. Um, industries and families and growers and landowners wanting to subdivide those uh, rural lots into small acreages. And there was actually a special disp dispensation in the Coffs Harbour LEP, a banana subdivision, and you were allowed to subdivide your land into six hectare lots if it was bananas. And even in the, I think it was in the 80s and 90s, the, the DCP then required that if, if you got this six hectare subdivision for your bananas, you had to have a 200 metre vegetated buffer, or no, a 40 metre vegetated buffer or a 200 metre kind of just grass or open buffer that was mandated. That's like 20 or 30 years ago. Now, what the banana lands mapping in the Coffs Harbour means in the LEP is that if you want to build a house, and you put in your DA, then one of the things on the checklist is they compare it on the map to was it in an area that was previously growing bananas, and then you have to do a soil contamination test because all of the chemicals that were used in the banana growing are still residual in the soil, so much so that you are required by law to do this soil testing to determine if it's a health hazard. And so you know, looking back on that pattern then, those farmers didn't know that this was a terrible chemical. They didn't know that, you know, organophosphates were going to turn out to be the problem that they are. But, you know, this is the pattern of agricultural chemicals. We have them, we discover, they get banned first in Europe, then America, then here, then other countries. So I guess to, just, you know, drawing that analogy about mapping what's kind of the purpose of that tool. I don't think we should be, you know, using it to exclude because we've seen, I guess, with the blueberries that um, they're not necessarily growing on what we had considered to be the best soils, what we've traditionally considered to be the great farmlands, but with different methods, it's working for agriculture. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know that it actually is super useful. I think we've actually just got to look at what's going on on the ground and make it work without a map. Uh, with the specifics of the question, I don't know enough about the specifics or the detail to answer um, and add anything intelligent to it. Um, but just with regards to mapping, I think people have had poor experiences with maps not being correct and, and whatever mapping needs to be that, that is done needs to be uh, double checked again on the ground and not just an aerial map. There's one here I've been given the newspaper cutting from the advocate. I don't know if it's to, is it today? It's February 27th. Yeah, it's today's. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's about I don't know if you've heard about this one where there's, there was some chemical containers found in the state forest that had been dumped. I think it's been quite widely publicised. This. So it's a question here: illegal land clearing and reckless use of dangerous chemicals has been and is of real concern in our local agriculture. This is totally unacceptable, but is happening and continues to be allowed to happen. How will you address this environmental problem? So the question is about the use of dangerous chemicals and, and land clearing. Sure. Um, the land clearing ones, I think, is a fairly easy one because the evidence of it stays around, so it should be fairly easy to see the evidence of illegal land clearing, and I'm all in favour of harsher penalties. Um, you know, if you've bought a farm that's already cleared, you've paid a premium for that land. People who are buying um, land and clearing illegally basically can undercut you because they've, they've paid a far cheaper price for it normally. So um, I'm in favour of strengthening those laws. Um, but around the chemical use, there's pretty stringent rules around that already. And again, we need to make sure that the compliance is up to scratch. Um. With regard to land clearing, I think there's often a lot of confusion about what actually is illegal land clearing. The vegetation clearing, clearing laws are complex and apply differently to different people. Um, everyone probably followed the recent example on the Pacific Highway where it was very obvious about clearing for a farm, including endangered environmental community and also koala, mapped koala habitat. 
because the land was zoned rural, there was actually no requirement to take account of the koala habitat mapping. So if I had have wanted to clear that forest to build a house, I would have had to have taken account of that mapping if I want to clear it for a farm, the rules don't apply. So I think there's a lot of complexity in conversations and I think we could do a lot better to strengthen our land clearing laws with regard to chemicals. I think Gomesh said it before, more cops on the beat. There needs to be more inspections, more spot inspections. Everyone who works in the food industry knows that people can come into your food premises at any time and do inspections. Um, I know that the council has done almost nothing of that kind of inspection. I think they've done one or two joint investigations with the EPA and when they've done it, they've found breaches in terms of like chemical stuff on every farm that they went to. So council could lift its game, the EPA could lift its game, harsher fines, just more scrutiny. Uh, on the chemicals, I think that I've already said that I think that legislation is the only way forward. With that, we have to have a broader view of that. I'm not quite sure where our local government is getting its information from and why it's closed its eyes to what's going on overseas, but um, I'm sure that in time that'll be addressed. As far as land clearing is concerned, um, I'm not over the... Uh, regulations regarding that, but it makes sense to me that um, unnecessary clearing of land um, violates the health of that land um, and the communities uh, associated with it. We need a balance of open land and um, natural uh, vegetation in order to maintain health through um, the sustainability of our biodiversity, our insect populations, um, holding water in the ground, etc. There are a whole uh, range of reasons why we need to do it and it does need to prote be protected and those laws should be enforced. Um, in relation to chemical dumping in, in the state forest, that was... Um, quite a significant following on Facebook recently at the back of Woolgooga, up in one of the wedding bells. The, um, look, every industry has good and bad people in it. People need to be brave enough to stand up and call it out. A lot of the people I've spoken to that have said, oh, you know, I've had stuff dumped on my land, I've had people come onto my property, and I say to them, well, have you called the police? Have you told the council? Oh, what's the point? You know, people need to be, people need to be brave enough to stand up and call it out and, and you know, get these people prosecuted. Um, just with regards to the dumping that happened a few weeks ago, I think it was a broader issue of dumping things illegally in the bush. I know that it was a chemical drums. One of the things I've been lobbying for is to have a drum muster drop-off point in Walgorga as well, not just in Coffs Harbour. Those drums actually, the, uh, the, the silly thing is they were actually free to drop off at the tip. So someone had to go, go out of their way to break the law in this case. So um, along with that was dumped a lot of heavy uh, rubbish that could have, that used to be picked up by the council uh, curbside collection. Since that curbside collection no longer occurs, um, I think we've seen an increase of rubbish dumping in the bush. We see it a lot when we go out mountain biking, especially up in Wedding Bells. So, um, you know, I'd encourage council to reinstate the curbside bulky good collection and to open a drum muster in Woolgorga as well. Yeah, look, I tend to totally agree. We need, I actually feel we also need a stronger EPA on this issue and I know that Sally reiterated that before. So I do feel like we need more cops on the beat. Yeah, I, I really um, think we could do something more with the EPA um, as a, a better cop on the beat. Um, they seem to, uh, if you have trouble with a bad neighbour, such as, uh, you know, whether you're spraying or uh, a quarry, you know, making too much noise or something like that, you can easily become a nuisance complainer at the EPA and even though you've got these issues, nothing happens. So, um, but, uh, you know... Uh, so I don't, I don't really know 
how you can strengthen that up, but I do know um, that um, State Labor, when looking at compliance on the DPI, um, especially to do with water and things like that and farming, um, and if they can't get the compliance out of the DPI, they're going to put... Uh, they, they may need an independent body, so... Um, that's how Labor's thinking about it at the moment. Also, Federal Labor have uh, worked really hard along um, eight years ago or so and had a uh, Commonwealth water trigger legislation. And uh, if only we'd had that in place, Adani wouldn't have a, a foot to stand on. It's a very good thing. It looks at water as a whole, whether it's groundwater, surface water falling on it. And um, through that, you can um, stop inappropriate development um, if it's shown to impact systems and things like that. So um, that's a bit of legislation that would be very good um, to have back again. And I'm sure it will help us on our creeks and, and rivers up here um, to have that strengthening in that water policy. So um, at, I don't know if I should say this about land clearing or what, but just my observations from where I live, you know, you see people buy a 30 acre bush block and, and uh, with the RFS fire laws, you know, they push an enormous amount of bush back and, um, and you think, why did you really want to live in the bush and, and, and then clear it all? Or, you know, I see development down at, at, at the beach where I live and um, there's some beautiful old trees and the developer takes every, every single one out and then people turn up to the nursery to buy new little seedlings and put it all back on and you kind of think, oh, it's a pretty crazy system. But uh, sometimes I wonder, I mean, obviously we need to be safe, but I wouldn't expect any farmer to lose their life over my place. I'd just be happy to leave. Probably haven't got much of a chance if there was a catastrophic fire or as it roars up the gully or whatever. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. We're, we're very consumerist in our homes. Um, and um, this affects... Uh, we choose to live in these places in the bush and this really does affect um, a lot of things that go on there. But um, they're big things that people don't really want to think about, but I just n note them from living there. I've got a couple of things to say about that article, um, starting with the dumping of chemical containers up in that forest. I actually hike up there. I live in Woolgorga and I, I hike that area and it's being treated by some people as a rubbish dump and that's about personal responsibility. That's not about whether you've got a bulk curbside pickup or not. That's about going out of your way to dump something in a forest area. Um, and I'd also question anybody who dumps a chemical drum like that in the forest, how are they treating those chemicals on their own property? How are they treating their own farm? The, per the person who acts that irresponsibly, are they acting responsibly with their chemicals in their farm? I think that's a valid question to ask. And the other one about land clearing laws. Look, land clearing laws at the moment, I think in a lot of cases, are being treated as either a joke or a cost of doing business illegal land clearing, in much the same way as underpayment of people's uh, staff is being treated as a joke. And it gets back to compliance and enforcement. If you're going to have a law, enforce the law and have proper compliance. Make sure that people actually comply with that law. I think there's a war against the public service. I think the public service has been under attack for about the last decade and a half. And I think the result is that you get this contempt for rules and regulations. We can, legi we can legislate all we like. There's no one to enforce it. Uh, uh, it's a federal example, but I think it's a good example. With the Biodiversity Conservation Act, uh, the, sorry, the Native Vegetation Act, where they defunded the compliance officers to the point where, um, sorry, I've forgotten his name now, but in the cultivating murder, the compliance officer was murdered out west. His colleagues took traumatic stress leave and the, and the agribusiness continued to devastate land. The federal government decided that the system was broken, so therefore they would, rename, um, they would bring in the biodiversity, so-called Biodiversity Conservation Act, which basically allows people to self-assess and clear whatever they like. I would like you to warn you all to be aware of the biodiversity offsets for developers. Developers can take out an ex uh, a threatened species by paying money for other things, including, uh, including 
doing research into what is causing the extinction of that species. How bizarre is that? And these are the laws. So when we say this clearing and we go, oh, that, is that illegal? It quite possibly isn't. They've got, they can do what they like. So we need to strengthen our public service. We need to, and the same thing's happening with national parks. They're getting wound back and wound back and restructured. And what I'm fearing that I'm going to hear not in the not too distant future, if we don't get a significant change in the political climate, is forest sharing agreements. State forests have sold too much timber, more timber than they've got. So they brought in the, the um, integrated forestry operations agreements where they can now harvest timber within five metres of a riverbank instead of 10 metres. They're exempt from federal environmental protection laws. We are in danger, people. This is dangerous time. And it's exactly the same when government is treating the land with contempt, people treat the land with contempt. We need good compliance. We need a strong public service. We need a great national parks. We need a great protected, uh, great, greater protection for our environment through legislation and things like local land services. Okay, we've got a question that sort of follows on from that. So, recently released amended biodiversity laws are meaningless. These laws are supposed to protect our water, land, wildlife and forests. Would you as a proposed candidate advocate for amending and strengthening our biodiversity laws and ensuring funding to properly monitor and regulate and enact these laws? Anybody want to have a go at that one? Yes. Okay. You don't all have to answer every question, that's fine. have got a lot more questions here. Uh, look, I'm not sure what Labor's policy is on the biodiversity stuff. I haven't read up on it. I just thought you wanted to talk about climate change and stuff tonight. But, yeah, sure. Well, sure I should, but, you know, like you've got to be on top of a whole lot of policy, not, not just farming stuff. I think the short answer is probably yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. No. Okay. Okay, next one. What will you do about introducing compulsory buffer zones or vegetated buffer zones between existing farms and neighbouring homes and schools? There's two questions here that relate. So closeness of blueberry farming to particularly someone's mentioned Sandy Beach Public School. But so, buffers, vegetated buffer zones between existing farms and neighbouring homes. Uh, what do you consider to be an acceptable distance for these buffer zones? And there's another question here as well. Also, do you want to see DAs for all future industrial farms? So maybe talk about the buffer zones. Um, what will you be doing about that? And what do you think is an acceptable distance? And then there's the question about the DAs. Okay, so I'll start with the buffers. I don't think it's useful to talk about buffers in terms of distance. I think we need to talk about effectiveness. So um, I'm in favour of farmers getting along with their neighbours and putting in a buffer, uh, whether that's a, a barrier, a screen, a vegetated buffer, um, I think that's something that can be decided between the farmer and the neighbour. Um, I think people need to be good neighbours to each other. Um, These are some, some things that people spoke about last night that, you know, not too long ago, people would take a six pack of beer over to their neighbour and say, let's have a chat about what we want to do here over this fence. Um, now. You know, the whole blueberry industry is a fast in this area, and I'm just sitting here boiling. Sorry, mate, I've been here for 36 years, and in the last five of years that's gone on around here, it has been absolutely disgraceful. You're running around, getting, putting the rates up with the old farmers, buying their land up, running around and giving them multi millions of dollars, and segregating that land into blueberries. And if the blueberry industry goes for foot, what are you going to do? A little off shop deal? with council to subdivide all the land and make it into rural development areas? You know? Sorry, I've, I've just 
I've got to the stage, I'm just like... Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I'll answer that. I haven't bought anybody's farm in the last 30 years, okay? You, you, no, I, I know what you were trying to say, but look, I am not responsible for the actions of 300 other people. I'll take responsibility for my farm. I'm not pointing it at you, I'm looking at the overall... So why are you making this politician for Because you'll be responsible for a lot of people, that's us. What, what I can do is continue to improve practices in the private sector like I have done. And as a politician, I can bring those things to law if, if elected. Um, I've forgotten what the original question was now. So the, the question was about compulsory buffer zones and right. between existing farms and neighbouring buffers, buffers and schools. Yeah. Yep. And um, whether you, about DAs for farms. Yep, so I've answered the first part of the question. Yep. The second part of the question, I do agree with DAs for AU5, large lot rural residential. We have those in Coffs. I think they have those in Bellingen and Nambucca now as well. Um, for AU5? But, okay, maybe Nambucca no, but Bellingen yes, Coffs yes. Um, for AU1 and AU2 where the primary purpose is for agriculture, essentially um, I was thinking of a good analogy for this. So. It's like having an art gallery and having to put in a DA every time you changed artists. If you've got the farmland, uh, it's zoned agriculture. If it's an existing farm, then there shouldn't be a DA. Um, I definitely think there should be buffers, just as there would be between other industrial land uses and residential areas. Um, and it's in, you know, all of the sort of work cover um, guidelines and best practice around pesticide use that, you know, people are required to inform their neighbours when they're spraying and in ensure that chemical trespass is not occurring. And look, I hope that there are some farmers that do go around and talk to their neighbours and tell them what's happening. In fact, I know there are some, but there are a lot who don't. And there are a lot of neighbours who try to have that conversation and have failed. Um, so physical buffers and yes, effectiveness, I, I agree. You know, thick vegetation is obviously more important than distance. Um, the proximity to schools, I think, is a huge worry. You've got Christian community, Bonville Public, Sandy Beach, and I think there's a preschool at Nana Glen, um, all, you know, butting right up against Blueberry farms, and I'm not aware in those schools whether the farmers notify the principal, notify the students of when they're spraying or what's happening. Um, by law, I think they should. If that my kids were at that school, I would be very concerned about it. Um, and so I think, you know, it comes back to this having... DPI has got loads of best practice guidelines about how to set up blueberry farms and soil and water management specifically for blueberries. There's heaps of technical information and not just blueberries, um, but there's that, that link between what we know is best practice and putting it into practice. There's a big gap in the middle and it's a problem for everyone and we need to solve it together. Excuse me, Sally. There are no laws that actually enforce these things. That's right, and that's the problem. I ended up There's in hospital last, last Monday <laughs> with a spray poisoning. Now, I have had a solicitor from Sydney. We've been up to my place and we've had a look at all of this sort of thing. And it is ridiculous. We're all beating around the bush. We're talking about things that we really want to be, I'm not saying you, but in general, we haven't got a proper plan on how to do these things. Lean. Lean. With buffer zones, they're not legally enforceable. So why, why are they being mentioned? Um, because I think most people agree that that would be really one of the most effective ways of separating what happens on this farm from leaving this farm and going on to this property. I understand that. But why aren't things like a clue of a chemical being discussed? When you look up the specifications, some of these chemicals have plumes without any wind affecting them 
of up to 120 to 150 metres. And yet, next to me, I have a, a farm operating and the blueberries are 20 metres from my roof line for where I collect water and they're spraying that particular distance. Okay, okay. No okay. to stop that. Okay, and I think that's really what the question's about, is about the buffers, isn't it, and trying to... Yeah, and I'll be quick here. Look, I think that we need to uh, we need to try and empower our local council. Uh, it's clear at this stage that the EPA either are underfunded, they don't have the resources. So unless that changes at the next state uh, election or this state election, um, I think that the local council have the opportunity to uh, put in the development application or the, you know that process so that we as a community can start to. Uh, feel a little bit more secure around those people who are responsible can manage, map, um, assess, they can review, they can they, they are the ones on the ground who are best placed to understand the issues. So I think empowering our local council is one way about doing that. Um, in terms of buffers, it's really hard. I mean these farms, blueberry farms, have a life expectancy of about 10 years. Okay, then they've got to get up and move. Sometimes they really, there's not a lot of land here. So I think that buffers are important. A 100 metre buffer would be great. You know, if we've got a 120 metre spray, well, we need a 100 metre buffer. I mean, we need, but is that practical? Um, we, you know, we talk about our waterways. I mean, I, I know a farm um, up around Corindi there that actually has its footprint in the upper, in the, in the average, or the annual, the annual flood zone, right? So when the, so this farmer has taken right down, in, he's filled in a gully, right? And then when the annual floods come through, they are actually taking out plants, irrigation, and the plastic with it, right? Now, I mean, I'm, I, you know, this is, this is sort of the, the kind of where we're pushing our, our farming is that there isn't a buffer right on those creek lines. And, and if we think about the Bucka Bucka Creek survey that the Southern Cross University did, and we talk about the, uh, the water quality going down to the Arara River, well, that's exactly where the Bucka Bucka Creek goes. And, uh, and all of those farms sit right on it. It doesn't matter. Even if you go down south towards the Bonville area, there are farmers putting their, their, um, their, their, their agricultural practices right on those creek lines. So, yeah, not an easy one to deal with, but I definitely think we need to have um, empower our local council. Can I just quickly mention, I'm not um, being very, very short. I've been here for a reasonable amount of time in this area. I have a daughter who's 32. It's not about what you grow here, it's how you grow it and what you use and what goddamn chemicals you're using. When the banana farmers were going out there years ago, I had to go into hospital to give tests that I had a miscarriage, that the person down the road had a hair leak. And all these medical field studies, were, medical studies were being done within Coffs Harbour Council because there was a high increase of deformities in this region. And if that had started okay. with the banana growers before, why has this massive blueberry industry started with... Can you, do you have a specific question around... And it's continuing again because of the chemical use. There are no studies, but here's one candidate who's coming up that's getting sick already. How many more are going to come? And they knew that it was okay. the banana industry. It was okay. So the next industry is the blueberry industry. Yeah, it's all the poisons and chemicals. Let's, let's hear what these folks have to say about it. Someone want to comment on that? Well, I guess I'd have to say that buffer zones sound mighty fine to me. I think that um, human health is. Um, critical in any of this and with some many unknown quantities um, in the chemicals that are actually being sprayed on a gr variety of um, on a variety of um, crops there it's essential just beg your pardon speak. absolutely yes it is um, if there's no legislation for it, I'm surprised. Obviously, in an area like this where we've got an increase in interest for residential allotments amongst our um, agricultural allotments, it's going to be an ongoing problem, so it does obviously need to be addressed. That seems to be a bit of a no-brainer. Um, what was the rest of the question, please? Whether about... Di um, do you want to see DAs for industrial farms? Well, industry, industrial farming, I would say yes, that there would need to be 
Um, development applications for that. I think people um, need to be informed about the changes of cropping and techniques and the implications of a specific um, type of crop in any kind area that has uh, human impact um, and even an impact on the environment as well. I really don't see an issue with that and I think there was some discussion last night about the impact of the cost to the farmer um, for that type of thing. There was a bit of discussion around that and I think that the end upshot of that was that it doesn't add a huge increase to the cost for the farmer. So I think as a safety measure for the broader community, um, I'd probably in principle support that. Um, yeah, we've wrestled with this for a couple of years on Nambucca Shire Council. Gurmesh actually came out pretty strongly against some of my stuff, so did my industry, my macadamia industry. So when you're talking about um, intensive uh, horticulture, um, I think it is good common sense for people with new developments to come before council and make an account of themselves. How big is the dam? You know, what trees are getting knocked down? How many plants you're putting in? You know, et cetera. What's your water licence? I think there's no, that, there's no harm and that's good neighbourly stuff to do is to come and make an account of yourself. Uh, it's very difficult uh, with existing farms, you know, who haven't got buffer zones in. So, um, I mean, often we, we say amongst ourselves there, uh, I think the development should take the buffer. You know, that often old farmhouses can be right on a fence because they've always been there and then a, a new person takes the farm next door and it's a different use. So they're all things that have to be nutted out. But um, I do believe um, at a state level, you know, probably uh, some sort of planning instrument is required for this community around this because we haven't been able to get stuff through on Bellingen Council. They tried to get, uh, based just on blueberries, um, in uh, uh, RU1, RU2 lands and stuff, and uh, uh, they, it didn't pass determination at the state level. So um, some sort of planning instrument at a state level is required. I've seen some people really badly hurt by what's gone on in our lands and they feel like they have no amenity and it's really horrible to be in that situation when you've been an investor up here and you've lived a long time and you've been sidelined just by a business. So um, it's all about, in the end, um, whether you want to talk about buffers or not, but it's about the community we make and uh, people have to be safe and people have to obey the law. Um, look, I just, I'm not, I'm not an expert on buffer zones. I think in principle that's a great idea, but I'd like to take issue with Gurmesh's analogy about the art gallery and changing paintings. I think a more appropriate analogy is if you move next door to a music venue that closes at 10 o'clock at night and somebody's playing an acoustic guitar there and singing, and suddenly that venue wants to open till two o'clock in the morning and play death metal, you probably need a development application. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree with development applications. C can you tell me, do you need buffer zones around Synchronicity Farm? At the moment? Yeah. Uh, no. No. So you don't, uh, you don't, your neighbours don't need to be protected from you? No, so, okay, so no, your neighbours don't need to be protected for you. Sounds to me like a buffer zone is like putting a band-aid on a severed limb. You know, it sounds to me like we need more stringent environmental health legislation. It sounds to me like we need to say no to the chemical product, to the chemicals. Let's say no to monoculture, no to chemicals, and let's put some incentive Let's put some incentives in for the farms that are growing things organically and biodynamically. So no, I don't support buffer zones. So I will probably get the same answer from someone using synthetic fertilizer as well. Can I just um, can I just say I definitely support buffer uh, vegetation and buffer zones on all waterways, but not um, that's that's kind of a different issue. But waterways completely because we need to keep uh, we need to protect our waterways. I actually have but my. Thank you, Arthur. 
Okay, this, so we'll make this is the very last question, and it was topical because it's linked to that one. So it says, riparian restoration and ensuring cattle and fertilizer runoff is essential to maintaining adequate oxygen levels in our rivers. How will you promote river health restoration, and how do you see farmers being engaged constructively in keeping our rivers healthy? Just a quick one, and then we'll, we'll finish. Yeah, okay. Um, look, I've just got an anecdotal stuff. Been on my farm a long time. I've got really huge barriers uh, down to my waterways, 30 metres, 50 metres. These are all vegetated. Um, and so mostly because I've used uh, organic fertiliser, it's been um, okay, but we, we thought uh, we, we just might spruce things up with a bit of nitrogen. We put a little bit out and it was only a moderate bit of rain and uh, I got an algal bloom on my dam for about eight months from this. Uh, it just goes to show you uh, what goes in our waterways. So, um, you know, any, any chemical uh, is a chemical and it's soluble in water. So, and it goes, I mean, I, I've got dams that hold it and then I'm up a deep creek water catchment area. It's very easy to, um, you know, create problems in our waterways for fish and recreational users. I'm not even sure the science is there just with the riparian zones you've got, they're not as big as mine. Um, but anyway, um, there's got to be faith, you've got to have something, so, uh, but it is much better, uh, better not to have those chemicals because the, the very nature of chemicals is that they're soluble in water. Um, unfortunately, right here, right now, we actually do have chemical use, extensive chemical use, so the only way to deal with that is with the appropriate buffer zones. I know that council have done extensive research in uh, our upper, uh, all our creeks and the average water quality uh, in our creeks sits at around a C minus. So if our rivers were at school, that river system would be about to fail and they'd be getting an enormous amount of attention from the, uh, from the school itself. So all of our rivers, four of our major rivers that the council have researched actually sit as a D or an E. Okay, some of them are better, some of them are worse, but the C, av C minus is an average. So our rivers are already in a very bad state. Uh, now, and that, you know, and, and really that is before the, uh, the, 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 really the expansion that we've seen in the blueberry industry, that it really has only exploded in the last 20 years. Um, so, you know, back in the year 2000, approximately 15% of our agriculture land use was with bananas and around two, one to 2% was uh, blueberries. 20 years later, blueberries sit at about 19%, uh, bananas that are about 4%. So we've seen a complete flick. Now, um, whether there's a difference, I don't know. I mean, like they're both using nitrogen, they're both using chemicals. There is no, this is intensive agriculture. So unless we start to uh, control our water use, limit water licenses, right? Shrink our agriculture um, and maybe do that as a short-term remedy because you know, what is the long-term unsustainability of our farming in the community? Maybe we need to see this in a 20-year cycle. Rebuild it, our river health get it back up to a, a, a quality um, that we can be able to uh, and then expand our agricultural industry again. I'm not sure what the answer is. I don't know if buffers are the answer. We've got scientists at Southern Cross University, experts in this trying to figure it out. Um, so it is, it's an issue for the entire community, um, but there's no doubt land use conflict, whether it's um, around our schools, around our community, around um, the biodiversity and water quality, we need to drink that water. Um, animals drink that water. Um, we need to make sure that, yeah, we have a really honest debate in our conversation, in our community, and that may mean we need to limit, um, yeah, intensive plant agriculture expansion for a short amount of time, and then see how our, uh, our environment rebounds. Um, without clean water, we got nothing. We have got nothing at all if we don't have water and our water resources and our, <laughs> and our water security and water health is massively under threat at a local level. We've heard a lot, a lot, a lot about that tonight. I think we get the picture. We've all seen the studies. We've all seen the creeks. We've all driven up those catchments 
obviously that is not what sustainability looks like. Even at a broader level, at a state level, we've seen disasters out in Western New South Wales. We've seen an ombudsman report handed to the New South Wales government saying that the, the whole government department, Water New South Wales, which was controlling water sharing and licensing and giving away for bugger all of that water to corporations, massive corporations, that whole department, or from the top of that department was found to be absolutely corrupt and full of maladministration, so much so that the Deputy Director General had to step down because it was rotten, rotten, rotten. So, you know, at a state level, at a government level, when we're saying, oh, who's going to stick up for the farmers? Who's going to look after the water for those people, for those towns? Well, not those guys, sorry. That's pretty clear. So at a local level, at a regional level, at a state level, we just need to say that the water is the most precious resource we've got and it shouldn't belong to those big corporations and it shouldn't be sold by them, it shouldn't be mined by them. It needs to belong to all of us. And there's that. But it's not just water, it's also clean air. And that's it, and you don't have a buffer zone around there. That's what I was getting at before. Sorry, I, I, I want to say, Tim, just maybe let go of me. I'll say, okay? Um. I was a little alarmed to hear uh, Jonathan say that we need to reduce our agriculture in this area. Um, no, he said, well, regardless, but um, reducing water licenses in this area is not the answer. Even organic farms need water and they need a license to use it. Um, I would rather see a sustainable industry grow out of what we have here. Um, I'm full of much more optimism than I think other people in this room. Um, I think that the majority of farmers do do the right thing and horticulture, horticulture in New South Wales is very important because if we don't grow it here in New South Wales, it'll have to come from Queensland. If we don't get it from Queensland, it'll have to come from overseas. Let's fix the issues. Let's work together and fix the issues. It comes from the sky. fantastic thing if council would come to the party on that and pump that water out to the farms because that is actually very useful. Thank you for bringing that up. And the thing, when we won that ocean outfall, all the new subdivisions were meant to have rainwater tanks. They were all meant to have, you know, um, composting toilet systems if they were on acreage. It all started, what's going down your own sink in your own backyard? Okay, we need to wrap this up because I think... I don't know who's a farmer here and who's not, but I know um, that I can say nitrogen and phosphorus are two of the main water pollutants. We don't even really need to be using nitrogen or phosphorus in a chemical form because there are microbes that we can foster and spray all over our plants that actually fix nitrogen straight out of the atmosphere. And same with the phosphorus fixing microbes, you can inoculate your soil, boom, you're, you're accessing free phosphorus that's in the soil already. The soil is full of phosphorus, yeah. the atmosphere is full of nitrogen. We don't need to be pouring chemical nitrogen and phosphorus on our plants. And that, was one, of the, that, and that was one of the... That was one of the key learnings out of the Bucket Creek study, was that nitrogen use was too high. Um, and phosphorus, we've been using a product called BioP, which is a bacteria. Nutritech. Yeah, Let's right. go Nutritech. Yeah, it's very, very, very expensive, but it's very effective. 
I grew 180 fruit trees at Sapphire Beach in a suburban block right next to the beach and I used orbitally rearranged molecular electrons almost and 65 barrels of seaweed and the proper stuff from around here, uh, river sand and quartz and all the things that were recommended at the last water sort of thing that we had at the uh, Catholic club that talked about all the problems that we can solve around here and you can do it. I was a success. I had beautiful fruit trees, no problem at all. They're still here to this day. 180 fruit trees in a suburban block. I did seven years horticulture at university. All you have to do is apply organics to it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right, we'll take that